Tonight, we're in Washington. This is a big night for Donald Trump, but drama with the Democrats could upstage him. As chair of the party, I apologize deeply for this. 24 hours after the Iowa caucuses and still no winner, but the results so far may surprise you. The state of our union is stronger than ever before. And the president relishing the chaos, impeachment nearly over, he makes his pitch for four more years. Also tonight, another case of coronavirus in Canada, this time in BC, and the patient has not been to China. Good one, buddy. And a reckless prank forces a plane to turn around mid-flight. What made you want to do that? Hear his reason for claiming to have the coronavirus. This is The National. We're in Washington, D.C. tonight in the middle of a hectic week of American politics. Tonight, the U.S. president delivers the State of the Union. I'm here in Freedom Plaza. Earlier tonight, Donald Trump made the journey from the White House just a few blocks that way to the U.S. Capitol behind us. And he did it, it seems, with an aura of invincibility. His audience tonight, the same Congress that impeached him and is expected to acquit him tomorrow. With that process almost in the rear view ahead, the battle for re-election. And if the Democratic debacle in Iowa last night is any indication, this is already looking messy. So it's been a full day now since the Iowa Democratic caucuses, which are supposed to be a major step in choosing the next candidate for president, but we still don't know who won. We are getting a bit closer, though. Tonight, the party released some of the results, just over half of them. And as Susan Ormerson shows us, those numbers are shaking up the order of the front runners. A big winner from that tortured, chaotic Iowa vote. A little later than we anticipated, <laughs> but better late than never. Newcomer Pete Buttigieg, a Midwestern mayor, potentially beating two U.S. senators and a former vice president. They show our campaign in first place. He and Bernie Sanders still jockeying for the top spot, assured of momentum. For some reason in Iowa, they're having a little bit of trouble counting votes. But a disappointment, Joe Biden, best known with the most experience, sure trailing the top three, a problem. We had a bumpy start to the Democratic process yesterday in Iowa. Senator Warren hit New Hampshire today, running third, trying to move on from Iowa. As chair of the party, I apologize deeply for this. The state Democratic night, Party struggling to recover from a colossal counting failure. The bottom line is that we hit a stumbling block on the back end of the reporting of the data. But the one thing I want you to know, we know this data is accurate. But hours before Iowans arrived yesterday for what was to be the triumphant opening act of the 2020 election, the party knew there were problems. A brand new app to tabulate results didn't work at all. Well, I couldn't even get off the screen. I'd end up with more people than there were actual people there. The app wouldn't download or even open in some cases. It was new and unfamiliar to volunteers. My main concern with the app was we didn't have a whole lot of time to play with it, to kind of understand what it was going to do. Turns out it was a coding problem, which has now been fixed. The app's designer saying we sincerely regret the uncertainty caused. No kidding. In the end, the old pen and paper cards saved the day. They're still being counted and verified tonight. All right, so Susan, we're still waiting, obviously, on a big chunk of votes to come. But can you sketch out how this shapes the race? Yeah, so Joe Biden, his big selling point was, I am the best guy to beat Donald Trump. You know, right. beat him like a drum. Yesterday, Iowans chose three other candidates other than him to do just that. Secondly, you know, Sanders and Buttigieg are really tied at the top. 
but that's in Iowa. Nationally, Sanders does poll first or second, Buttigieg quite a bit far down. So it's early. There are a third more votes to come out of Iowa. It's only the first state. It gives us a glimpse, but too early to predict a trend. I will say, historically, you know, there's often an Iowa surprise, yeah. but no one expected this kind. No, 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 not like this. Susan, thank you You're very welcome. much. Appreciate that. Now, inside the Capitol tonight, Donald Trump strode in to applause, clearly relishing the moment. And then he delivered a State of the Union seemingly unburdened by impeachment, ticking off all the achievements of what he's dubbed the great American comeback. So Paul Hunter is here to put the night in some perspective. Paul, what, what has Trump delivered this evening? Well, it seems to be a blueprint for Donald Trump's re-election campaign, a recitation of achievements as he sees them, focusing largely on the economy, bullet points on the unemployment rate and job creation. He called it the blue-collar boom. He talked about the growth in the stock market and the prosperity he envisions still to come. Expect to hear a lot of this on the coming campaign trail. Here's a sample from early on in the speech. Jobs are booming. Incomes are soaring. Poverty is plummeting, crime is falling, confidence is surging, and our country is thriving and highly respected again. All of this tonight in the very room where Democrats impeached him in December. Sitting directly behind him is Nancy Pelosi, Speaker of the House, who directed the impeachment process against him, rarely even looking directly at Trump as he made his case on why Americans should vote him in for a second term. And in the matter of impeachment, did he go there? Well, everyone wondered if he'd go off script, but he's pretty much stuck to it. And he didn't really take on Democrats directly. But one of the other tacks he's expected to take in the coming campaign, especially if Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren gets the Democratic nomination, is to push back against anything that even sounds like socialism, a.k.a. some of the Democrats' proposals to reform the health care system. His pushback tonight on that brought a big round of applause from his fellow Republicans. Here's some of that. 132 lawmakers in this room have endorsed legislation to impose a socialist takeover of our health care system, wiping out the private health insurance plans of 180 million very happy Americans. To those watching at home tonight, I want you to know we will never let socialism destroy American health care. Look, this is a good week for Donald Trump. Uh, on this stage tonight, stronger poll numbers than he's ever seen. And tomorrow, if all goes as expected, indeed, he'll be acquitted in the Senate at his impeachment trial. He could say the state of the Trump presidency is strong. And as his reelection campaign kicks in, he wouldn't be far off. All right, Paul, thank you very much. And so from the president back to the people, in about 25 minutes, we head to Iowa, where voters aren't just questioning what went wrong last night. They are wondering if the entire caucus process needs a major rethink. And we'll also hear, Andrew, from our uh, panel of U.S. political insiders. Until then, back to you in Toronto. Okay, we'll see you soon, Adrian. Well, Canada now has its fifth case of the coronavirus, and this time it's someone who had not previously been to China, which would suggest person-to-person -person transmission. So this is a person, a resident of, of Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, and uh, they had, uh, she and her family had family visitors from Wuhan who are still here and living in the house. The woman's relatives in Canada are now under observation as well, though we don't yet have details on where or who they may have come into contact with in British Columbia. Meanwhile, at the epicenter of the outbreak, the numbers keep going up. Chinese officials now say at least 490 people have died and some 24,000 people are now infected, most of them in Hubei province. Now, Canadians inside China's infected zone could be allowed to leave the country as early as Thursday, but not all of them. China is being very strict about who's allowed in or out. And as David Cochran explains, that's just one of several hurdles. Prime Minister, will Canadians... The plane isn't even in China, but the Prime Minister says it's already full. Right now there is a larger number of Canadians asking for evacuation than there is space on the plane. 
Canada has chartered a plane from Portuguese airline Highfly to carry the first wave of evacuees to Trenton. But the Airbus only seats 250 and more than 300 want to leave. Simple math means some will be left behind. We have an option, depending on the numbers, we have an option for a second plane. Capacity is one issue, Chinese policies are another. Canadian citizens will be allowed through police checkpoints and to board the plane as long as they aren't sick. But permanent residents or Chinese citizens who live in Canada are a different story. China says they can only get on the plane if they are the sole guardian for a Canadian child who would otherwise travel alone, which leaves some people stuck. I don't know who I'm mad at, but it's, there's something wrong somewhere. Megan Millward and her two children are Canadians, but her husband, Zhang Liu, is a permanent resident, which means he isn't clear to travel. They tell us only three people on the list, so I, I'm not on the list. We're all going to go to the airport and we're going to talk to as many people as we can to try to get somebody to change their mind, because if China says, yes, it's fine, he's, he can go. So far, China has said no. I saw the news, I saw the, the family stories, Obviously, everyone wants to do their best to bring all these people home. Champagne hopes that first wave can start their trip home by Thursday, pending China's final permission. After that flight, they'll see how many Canadians still want to leave and then decide whether to send that second plane or try to get seats on flights organized by other countries. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. It's been 24 hours since Hong Kong's first coronavirus death was reported, and officials there are still trying to figure out how patients got infected. But as Chris Brown tells us, residents are more concerned about making sure they don't get it. Word of Hong Kong's first death from the coronavirus seemed to add a sense of urgency today at this pharmacy selling protective face masks. We're very worried, said this woman. The government can't control this virus. That's why we feel helpless, why we're looking for masks everywhere. With that worry also comes price gouging. A pack of 50 masks that would normally have cost $8 Canadian sells here for $60. This man told us the anxiety is making people overpay. I think that's the sentiment in Hong Kong right now. It is festering over the past couple of days. The man who died in hospital Monday morning had visited Wuhan in China and was just 39 years old, but he had diabetes, which made him higher risk. It's the other new cases of infection that authorities are having a harder time explaining. Most of the people here who have become sick have had a direct connection to China's Wuhan area, either by visiting themselves or having a relative who did. But doctors say in two new cases and two older ones, it's not clear how the patients got sick, calling it an invisible change chain of infection. There's a significant risk of communi community transmission in Hong Kong. In one instance, a Hong Kong clothing store owner got sick, perhaps catching the virus from a customer. Schools and universities have been closed and students urged to stay home and avoid big groups, but clearly some people are already getting stir-crazy with the restrictions. We need to go out to have the fresh breath, uh, fresh air. Up at the landmark peak viewpoint, we met teacher Eva Young and a bunch of her teenage students, all of whom said they just had to take a break from their self-imposed quarantine. Wow, and so Chris, uh, can you give us more of a sense of just what it's like in Hong Kong right now? Well, we were talking just there about masks, Andrew. It's now Wednesday morning here, and we got these pictures sent to us overnight from a big lineup across the harbour in Kowloon where people, hundreds of people literally camped out overnight to try to get these face masks uh, when they heard that a supplier was releasing half a million of them in a couple of hours from now. So that speaks to the urgency of the demand here. Andrew. Wow. And what about the walkout by healthcare workers? Well, uh, it's day three now of this walkout. Several thousand healthcare workers are trying to pressure Carrie Lam's government to close the last remaining land crossings with mainland China to try to prevent people from bringing in potentially the coronavirus. Uh, so far, Carrie Lam has said no, they're not going to do that. But uh, today is the deadline that the healthcare workers have set. If that doesn't happen, there could be more escalation. Andrew. All right. Chris Brown in Hong Kong. Thanks very much. Let's go to Dan Burt now, who's standing by in Vancouver with some breaking news. Dan. 
news on the coronavirus front. We've learned tonight Princess Cruises says several hundred Canadians are on board a cruise ship near Japan, on which 10 other people tested positive for coronavirus. Tonight, the cruise company says 251 Canadians are on board. There are no Canadians among the 10 people confirmed to have the disease. Japan's health minister says all of the 3,700 people on board will be quarantined on board the ship for up to two weeks. It's still not clear how those infected got the virus. This ship stopped in Vietnam, Taiwan, Kagoshima and Okinawa. The ship returned to Yokohama near Tokyo on Monday. We'll follow the story throughout the night. But for now, back to you, Andrew. And a coronavirus scare forced hundreds of people on a WestJet flight from Toronto to Jamaica to turn back. The cause of the problem, a prank. Farah Morali spoke to the man behind it today. This video posted on a Toronto social media site shows James Potok being escorted off a plane while being jeered by passengers. Oh, they got you on camera too. You're a clown, man. Can I have your attention? It's the aftermath, what Potok says was supposed to be a joke. I stood up, I said, I just returned from a flight from Hunan province. Um, I might have said, this is the capital for coronavirus. And then I said, I don't feel too well. What made you want to do that? Well, it was, uh, it was really just to create a, a viral video. That was a good one, buddy! The WestJet pilot didn't find the joke funny. The crew segregated him as a precaution, a and the plane was turned around. 240 passengers, who were supposed to end their day in Jamaica, ended it here instead, at Toronto's Pearson International Airport. This is, you know, time that we've allotted to enjoy, and now we're stuck in Toronto. We were all very frustrated. It's just so selfish. Why would you think that would be funny to, to make a video like this? I guess it was a shock and awe type of thing. Um, you know, being able to think about it after, it's, it's definitely something that's not joked about. Once I found out that they were turning the plane around is when I felt the remorse, I felt guilty. So now I'm thinking to myself, well, I, I think I just ruined 250 other people's travelers' plans. So that, you know, that, that hit me. That bothered me. If you had a message for those people, what would that be? I am extremely sorry. Um, I'm completely remorseful to everybody that I, I damaged their plans. That wasn't the only flight that had to be cancelled because of this prank. The trip from Montego Bay back to Toronto, that the same plane was supposed to take, was also scrapped. We reached out to WestJet to see if it planned to take action. It would only say the matter is now before the courts. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. We are getting a look at exclusive new video showing the deadly aftermath of a runaway train in British Columbia. Next, a CBC News investigation and calls for police to get involved. There really needs to be a criminal investigation. Alberta's plan for taller wooden buildings has firefighters sounding the alarm. Oh my God. <gasps> And we're back from Washington with our political insiders. Plus, is it time to change how Iowa caucuses are run? Rethinking Iowa the day after a Democratic disaster. We're back in two minutes. It's been one year since a runaway train in British Columbia crashed down a mountain into a river. Today, across the country, CP Rail held a minute of silence for the crew that was killed. Conductor Dylan Parody, engineer Andrew Dockrell, and trainee Daniel Waldenberger Bulmer. Now, the Transportation Safety Board's lead investigator into the crash called for a criminal investigation last week, but he's since been demoted over those comments. The CBC's Dave Seglins has that story and exclusive new video from the scene. This video shows train 301. Its brakes failed. It was torn apart along the mountain. A high-speed crash involving 112 loaded grain cars. The locomotive landed in a river, shown here covered. The wreck where three CP rail workers died. The transport minister, the minister of public safety, need to step in. This professor wrote a book on the Lac Megantic tragedy. He says Canada's Transportation Safety Board is investigating the BC case, but it's not its role to look at potential criminal negligence at the railway. 
Transportation Safety Board is going to find some answers in a year about the causes, or at least a range of causes, but it's not going to tell the full story. So there really needs to be a criminal investigation in this case. CBC's Fifth Estate exposed a string of failures with CP Rail's mountain trains, the brakes, maintenance, inspections. Last week, the TSB's lead investigator told us there is enough to suspect there's negligence here and it needs to be investigated by the proper authority. Well, that landed him in hot water. TSB has demoted him. He's no longer investigator in charge. The TSB saying it was completely inappropriate to voice any opinion implying civil or criminal liability. There's controversy, especially since the crash happened on CP property. CP Rail's own police force says they did an investigation into the actions of the crew. They say it was thorough and resulted in no charges. I can't put his pictures up yet. Frustrating for the families of the dead workers who want an independent investigation of the company. I wish there was some other policing organization who could do a criminal investigation on them because why do you say that? I don't trust CP to police itself. CP Rail won't comment on the specifics of the crash as they wait for the TSB's findings expected in a year. However, the RCMP now says they are reviewing this case, talking to the TSB and other federal agencies, considering next steps. Dave Seglin, CBC News, Toronto. And we are following several other stories tonight, including another legal hurdle cleared for the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. We welcome today's decision by the court. It affirms that we delivered on our duty to consult through a meaningful two-way dialogue. In a unanimous decision, the Federal Court of Appeal dismissed an effort by four First Nations groups in BC to block the project. It ruled that consultations with groups along the route were adequate. This marks a major victory for the long-delayed $7.4 billion project. But some Indigenous leaders say they are considering an appeal to the Supreme Court. The Liberal government has reintroduced legislation to help ensure judges are trained in sexual assault law. This bill is designed to strengthen training requirements for judges and provide them with important insight into the myths and stereotypes that too often surround sexual assault. Bill C-5 closely mirrors proposed legislation tabled back in 2017 by former Conservative MP Rana Ambrose, but that legislation stalled in the Senate. If passed, the bill would also change the criminal code to ensure judges put their reasons on the record when they rule on sexual assault cases. Next from Washington, the state of the Trump economy. Ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come. Donald Trump takes credit for an American comeback, but what does that really look like? We'll get lots of attention, yeah, wherever we go. Quite know what to call them, but they know they're onto something. You'll meet the guys behind the smart car snowmobile. Just ahead. Very incredibly, the average unemployment rate under my administration is lower than any administration in the history of our country. Clearly, Donald Trump did not hesitate to bask tonight in the glow of some impressive economic numbers. Unemployment is at about a 50-year low. The stock market surging near all-time highs. And it's happened as the president's spending boom and tax cuts launch a new American era of trillion-dollar deficits. Peter Armstrong takes a closer look at the Trump economy. Another day, another banner close on Wall Street. The president's never been shy about claiming responsibility, even buying a pricey Super Bowl ad. Best wage growth I think we've seen in almost a decade. Unemployment rate sinking to a 49-year low. Trump says America is safer, stronger, and more prosperous. And ladies and gentlemen, the best is yet to come. But the American economy isn't one single narrative. It's millions of stories playing out in real time. Sure, the stock market's doing great, but job growth has slowed under Trump, and regions that struggled before he was president still are. Coal miners in Kentucky blocking the tracks. They say they haven't been paid in months. 
I'd say after tonight, even if we do get to go back to work, I ain't going to be, be able to because I'm out here. Trump famously promised to return America's coal industry to its former glory. We will put our miners back to work. But the coal comeback never happened. In fact, coal capacity is being removed at a faster pace under Trump than it did under Obama. In America's farming heartland, Trump's trade wars have hit home. We're doing okay. Farmers have been racked by years of uncertainty, and now many worry their voices will be lost in the cacophony of an election year. I'm thinking that we might get missed in uh, who they're picking to uh, focus on. America's a divided nation, Republicans, Democrats, but just as importantly, divided between those who have seen gains from a booming stock market and corporate tax cuts and those who have seen their wages stagnate. There's the rhetoric and then there's the fact. Economists like Brett House spend election years trying to cut through the rhetoric. Manufacturing is more or less in a recession in the U.S. The farm bailout is twice what was given to the auto sector back in the financial crisis. And we've seen that, you know, a number of other sectors that are really dependent upon trade with China aren't doing well at all. That said, it's not all doom and gloom. The U.S. economy is still growing, just not always in the ways or sectors the president claims. Peter Armstrong, CBC News, Toronto. Next from Washington, the State of the Union with our political insider panel. Plus, Senator Sanders, how are you feeling today? I'm fine, thanks. How are the results so far? A day late, Democrats are finally getting some caucus results, and they're not exactly happy with the process. Rethinking Iowa after the break. Welcome back to Washington. The focus today in what is a big week for U.S. politics. Tonight here, Donald Trump delivered the State of the Union on the heels of what was, let's just say, an interesting night in Iowa. The Iowa Democratic caucuses are the first step in the race to the White House, but tonight we still don't know who won because of a problem counting the votes. As Katie Simpson shows us, that is only adding to calls for the whole caucusing process to change. Senator Sanders, how are you feeling today? Fine, how are the results so far? Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Leaving Iowa near the top of the pack, Bernie Sanders resisted indulging his frustration over how long it took to get official results. Is it time to change how Iowa caucuses are run? Thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Uh, Last night's embarrassing vote count debacle comes at a time when serious questions are being raised about the importance of Iowa. Do you think this is the death knell for the Iowa caucus? I hope not, but certainly maybe in the form that we are in at this point, I think things have to be rethought. The state is small and not as diverse as the rest of the country. So how a candidate does here may not be an accurate way to gauge national support. That has some questioning why Iowa gets to be the first place to test a candidate since the results could make or break a campaign. The idea here is if you finish down in the pack, your money dries up, your media coverage begins to be framed as your can candidate is on, you know, its last legs. There's also the practical challenges of caucusing that some people don't like. It was actually really exciting and really interesting, even though it was a bit disorganized. We had to count and recount over and over and over again because people just kept moving. I actually wanted to participate in the uh, caucusing yesterday, but I needed to work. Republicans are taking advantage of the moment, saying that if Democrats can't even run a caucus, how can they run a country? That political fallout may be the biggest motivating factor to re-examine the entire process. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Des Moines, Iowa. From the chaos in Iowa last night to the triumphant tone from Trump tonight. Our panel of political experts is watching David Frum, senior editor with The Atlantic, is here with me in Washington. Republican strategist Jay Shabria is in Columbus, Ohio and Democratic strategist Tracy Seff. Seffel is joining us from Washington. So everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. I just want to point out that as Trump's speech was ending, Nancy Pelosi appeared to, to rip and then throw away a copy of the speech. If you haven't seen it, you really should see this moment. Let's have a look. Thank you, God bless you, and God bless America. Thank you very much.
All right, David, let's start with you. Any surprises at the, you know, the very visual divisiveness there? Well, given that this may be the longest speech Donald Trump has yet given as president, and perhaps one of the top three longest speeches ever given by a president, I think Nancy Pelosi just showed really impressive forearm strength there. <laughs> okay, not the answer I was expecting. Tracy, what about you? Well, sitting behind the president as she did, I don't think she needs the paper copy to remember what just happened. That was an extraordinary speech filled with game show theatrics and some highly questionable assertions. And I think watching her face is a good barometer for how Democrats will be responding. So given, given the week that this is, you know, the Democratic disaster, that, that was Iowa, arguably, the Senate vote that's going to go Trump's way tomorrow. Uh, Jay, let's start with you on this one. Is this the speech you thought it would be? Well, I don't know that you can ever expect a Donald Trump speech and, and be right on it because there's always something different. Uh, there, there were some things that really surprised me. Um, he's always he's that reality talk show host. He's that, that guy that uh, that hosted that show, that that hit show on NBC. And tonight, what you saw was a, he was able to tug at the hard strings. A lot of times when he pointed to the gallery, when he pointed to military families that had lost a loved one. But then he also brought back um, a military man to reunite his family on live TV at a State of the Union. I don't know that I've ever seen something like that, and I'm sure that's going to go over very well. So look, he had lots of uh, economic accomplishments he was touting. He had lots of partisanship, uh, red meat for his base, and then he had these daytime talk show hosts, host theatrics, which I think is going to really play well. Well, certainly Donald Trump uh, understands the power of the medium. David, what about you? Is is this a speech you thought you would hear? Well, um, he's got a strong story to tell in the economy, and that's where he focused. Um, he uh, had some attempts at so, sort of some normal human moments. Um, the speech in the, I think, final third really did follow, and, and this is the moment where the most mm -hmm. partisan people are walking, it followed the line of his American carnage speech. Im uh, illegal aliens out there to kill you, um, endless wars. The speech turned quite dark in the last third. I think by then he had assumed that um, the regular viewers had stopped watching at the one hour mark. T Tracy, I I'm curious about what it's like from your perspective, because this has not been a great week f for Democrats. You were in Iowa. I, I, I imagine you knew last night that Republicans would seize on what has happened there and, and, and mock it. Now, we didn't hear that in the speech tonight, but, but how, how bad is it right now for Democrats? Well, if there's one thing about Democrats, it's that we're used to the, um, the foibles and the fumbles, and last night was hugely unfortunate there's no question now was it some sort of catastrophic event no it wasn't and the results will be in i'm pretty sure the constitution doesn't say anything about providing immediate results to cable news hosts um, but you you didn't quite know that watching coverage last night it was you know defcon situation uh, the results will come in the problems will get fixed it was human error and it's most unfortunate what I saw in Iowa was a really vibrant Democratic caucus with hundreds of people at the various precincts um, excited and energized and really appreciating their moment as Iowans to do that unique and um, authentic caucusing. So there's really two storylines, what happened on the ground and the hysteria with which people have responded. There definitely was a problem and a mistake and things will be fixed. But life goes on. Democrats know what happened last night is not in any way indicative of our losing focus on November and the goal to replace Donald Trump with a Democrat in the White House. So I Adrian, think I, I, one of the things that, w that was, go ahead, Jay, go ahead. Yeah, see, and, and I appreciate Tracy's spin on this, but I don't know that Democrats ever had focus on the White House. I don't know that they've actually really focused on it. They, I think they've made tactical errors by going after Donald Trump on impeachment, which was appeasing to their base, but not really smart in terms of taking back the White House. Last night was an opportunity to showcase their message and to start to winnow their field. They lost that opportunity. And now they're in a new cycle where the president controls it again with this speech, which is largely pro-America, and now they're going to have to be seen as people that are cheering against American success. I think, I, I don't know that the Democrats have ever had focus, and, and that's going to be the problem for them in November. That's, I, I have to say, one of the candidates, Bernie Sanders in this case, who 
quite likely will emerge victorious out of Iowa. His signs, I, I have to share this with your viewers, it was really interesting. They simply had three words on them, and it said, Bernie beats Trump. And that was it. That's all his signs said. And I think that shows some focus right there. And certainly, the, these few days, this week, is an extraordinary conflation of, uh, or a perfect storm of events, if you will. And I have no doubt that there will be, you know, the sort of quirks that will come of this and people will all too happily point to Iowa as somehow the, the crumbling of the Democratic Party. And I can assure your viewers that isn't the case. Unfortunate, crazy timing. Everything that's happening this week, frankly, is unprecedented and crazy in its compression. So I just want to say one thing. It is Washington. It is incredibly loud. There's always a sense of urgency here. People, important people, are always on the move. But I, I do want to get back to that State of the Union speech for a moment because, you know, the president did not go there in the sense of, of mocking the Democrats for what happened last night, but, but he certainly went there in terms of being exceptionally boastful about what he has done. And I think we have a clip of, of him of him basically crowing about what he's accomplished. Can we have a listen to that? Jobs are booming. Incomes are soaring. Poverty is plummeting. Crime is falling. Confidence is surging. And our country is thriving and highly respected again. Okay, so we don't have much time left. I just want to get to you, David, on this point. You have written State of the Union speeches. Yeah. Is that is that standard for the toolkit, or is is, is that unusual hyperbole? Um, it, it, it's unusual because it's so exaggerated, um, because it ha is so weakly based in fact. But I think it's really striking about the speech is how little it talked about the future. Normally what you do in a State of the Union address is, yes, a president takes credit where there's credit to be mm -hmm. taken, but a president also gives an affirmative vision of what the president is like to do. Um, when Donald Trump says things like the best is yet to come, what he's revealing is how vague he is. This is actually, in terms of things he's got done that he personally did, this is the thinnest record of accomplishment of any first term president, and he has even fewer ideas for a second term. On that point, this is just the last question to everyone here. Is there any reason to believe th that we are not looking, you won't like this, Tracy, but that we are not looking at anything other than a second, a two term president? Tracy, let's start with you. Well, certainly that is what Democrats hope does not happen. I'm happy to give Trump credit for his oversimplification and connecting with. The, the audience by the simple noun verb construct that he used there. I appreciate that and I know that it resonates. Unfortunately, it was full of mistruths, exaggerations, and crazy overstatements. Um, the Democrats, it's incumbent upon us to unpack that, but to do so in a way that is speaking at that same level. Trump's gift, if you will, is to speak at that very basic level. Democrats know that he was saying things that simply weren't true. All you had to do was look at Speaker Pelosi's face, and you could recognize every time he would strike a chord that was completely dissonant, she would react accordingly. And so it's incumbent upon the Democrats to make sense of that, but to do it in a way that is straightforward and convincing and frankly reinforces that Democrats will not only be attentive to the growth in this economy, but ensure the security for working families. This isn't about Wall okay, Street. Gonna, this isn't about pharma. I'm, this is about working families. I'm going to have to jump in there, Tracy, all of you. I, I'm sorry, we're going to have to cut it off here. David from Jay Shabria. Tracy thank Seppel, thank you very much for joining us. And that is, that is it from Washington tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. And now back to Andrew in Toronto. And up next, firefighters speak out against the plan to build taller buildings made of wood. It creates a whole new dynamic for firefighting. Alberta is raising the limits, and that is raising serious concerns. We're going to look at that right after the break. Welcome back. Starting this spring, Alberta will allow the construction of taller wood buildings. The province has approved building code changes that will double the current height restriction. Officials say the material is safe, but as Rafi Bujikanyan tells us, firefighters are not convinced. Wood buildings are supposed to be better for the environment, faster and easier to build. 
But the Alberta government's change to the allowed height of wooden construction projects from six stories to 12 has some firefighters raising the alarm. It creates a whole new dynamic for firefighting. Brad Reedman has been a firefighter for more than a decade. He's seen enough wood building fires to make him concerned about the new rules. Like this scene in Houston six years ago, when someone narrowly escaped a terrible fate. Oh my God. <gasps> he says firefighters say they're particularly concerned about resources in rural areas. So we want to make sure that the plans are in place, uh, emergency response plans, training, adequate training. They're also upset the province didn't tell them it intended to allow wood structures up to 12 stories tall as of this spring. They found out through social media. Reedman says BC checked in with its firefighters before moving ahead. We want to make sure that everything's being looked at, not just uh, rushed through to, for the sake of uh, cutting red tape. So it creates more jobs, uh, it creates opportunities for, for people. Also Representatives from the lumber industry say they welcome what they hope will be a construction boom and that safety concerns have been addressed through burn testing thick multi-layered wood. Fire can, uh, has a hard time to, to keep eating away. It creates a layer of char and then once that layer of char is created, uh, the fire doesn't have that energy any longer. The provincial government said it had no concerns about safety when it announced the changes last week. We want to help companies get our people back to work. A handful of tall wood buildings exists in other parts of Canada, Quebec, Ontario and BC. And the same rule change is expected in the National Building Code later this year. But firefighters here are still asking to meet with the province. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Okay, let's turn now to some of the stories making headlines around the world tonight, including clashes between police and protesters in Greece. It happened on the island of Lesbos. A migrant camp there is housing more than 19,000 people. That's six times its capacity. So protesters are demanding better conditions and that the asylum process be sped up. Riot police moved in, though, to break up the crowd, and things got violent. Tesla continues to defy expectations, with the electric car maker's shares soaring 40% in the past two days. Today, the increase was about 14%, closing at nearly 900 US dollars a share. That means the company has more than doubled in value since the start of 2020 and is now the world's second most valuable car maker, despite never having made an annual profit. Tesla says it expects to sell 500,000 vehicles this year. And actor Shannon Doherty revealed today that she's once again battling cancer. The former star of television shows like Charmed and Beverly Hills 90210 says she has stage four cancer. She calls her diagnosis a bitter pill to swallow and says she's still processing it. Now, she didn't share what type of cancer she has, but she has previously undergone treatment for breast cancer. She's 48 years old. Okay, coming up in our moment, how to conquer winter the smart way. A pair of longtime Newfoundland buddies take a used smart car and a little ingenuity to have some big fun. Don't go anywhere. So as is often the case, this past Groundhog Day didn't exactly produce a clear consensus on how much more winter we've got in store. So maybe best to assume the worst. Now, Newfoundlanders, as we know from their recent blizzard, would certainly be up to that challenge. And in tonight's moment, you'll see they know how to do it in style. This one was the one that we bought first to do that with, and my brother found that one online. From there, away we went. After Newfoundlander Perry White bought his uh, smart ski -doo, let's call it, his buddy Jeff Humphreys upped the ante and made his own. I see my buddy with Perry with one, brought it down from Alberta somewhere, so I decided to try it. So pretty easy on paper. You replace the wheels with tracks and skis, and you're good to go. Oh, we get lots of attention, yeah, wherever we go. People taking pictures and wanting to go for rides. Just to be a little different, I guess, than everybody else, you know. The best part? And you can convert it back into a car put it on the road in about three hours. So the springs comes now, I'll put the tires back on it and drive it on the road again. <laughs> 
Just like that. Um, <laughs> so I joked about how it's it's uh, easy on paper to whip that together. I mean, it, you know, it's not that easy. Apparently, you know, they tell us that you have to change a few fuses for traction control, disable the anti-lock brakes, but that they managed to get that job done in just a few weeks. So there you go. And uh, apparently they don't even have a name for it yet. So if you have any thoughts, uh, send them our way. That's The National for this February 4th. Have a good night.